Hey everyone, it's Andrew with the Wooden Hobbyist Woodworking Channel and today I bring you part 2 of a full bass guitar build where we will be focusing on making the neck. So if you haven't seen part 1, I'll leave a link in the description so you can go there and come back if you want. Grain selection is key to a good looking guitar, so I used my acrylic neck template to mark out a rough area to mill around. We've been making complete template sets that make building guitars stupid simple. I ripped one edge on the bandsaw just so it fits my jointer as the original board was too wide. Having a long straight piece of wood here is critical because no one wants a bent shaft. I got a flat face on one side, planed it down then remarked where I wanted the neck before ripping everything down to a more manageable size on the table saw. I marked the center line on the top and bottom of the neck blank to make lining everything up much easier. Once it was prepped, I pulled out this piece of Zircote for the fretboard. Little did I know this would be the most ridiculous species of wood I have ever had the displeasure of working with. I resawed a 3 8 inch piece off of it and noticed the sawdust was super sticky and slightly pasty. It gummed up all my blades and stunk like hell. After about an hour at the drum sander, I finally got to see how gorgeous this sticky stinky wood actually was and started feeling a little bit better about it. By the way, the final thickness was approximately one quarter of an inch. Once the thickness, I squared it up on the table saw and added a center line with a pencil. One of the things I was always most intimidated by when I started making guitars was slotting the frets. The level of accuracy necessary seemed unattainable for someone as impatient as me, until I found out about these templates. They have notches which fit around a pin on a special miter box, perfectly spacing each fret rather than measuring them out or spacing them out with a fret ruler. If you plan on making guitars or want to give making your own fretboard a shot, I highly recommend using these templates in this miter box. The templates have different scale lengths to your needs and I'll leave a link for each type in the description. After all the frets were slotted, I notched out a cool little design at the heel of the fretboard to act as an overhang thingy. It's meant to slightly mimic the headstock as a design element and takes an extra step, but it's worth it. Before I could glue the fretboard to the neck, I needed to install the truss rod. With a quarter inch upcut bit and a router, I used a straight edge to run down the center line, taking multiple passes until I reached the correct depth. I had to chisel out a larger area at the end for the thicker end portion of the truss rod and checked for a super satisfying fit. During glue up, I made sure not to add glue to where I wanted the overhang on the fretboard. It probably would have been beneficial to add painter's tape at the cutoff, but hindsight is always 2020. Since I marked out the center lines earlier, it was extremely easy to line everything up and clamp into place. This is a perfect time to use as many clamps as possible to ensure you have no weak spots or pockets in the glue up, as a truss rod will later add pressure against it. Once dry, I stuck my handy dandy acrylic template to the fretboard with some handy dandy double sided tape. This tape, by the way, is my absolute favorite because it's not only strong but leaves essentially no residue. I cut out a lot of the waste at the bandsaw, trying to leave as little as possible for the router table later on. For the overhang, I used a handsaw to cut away what wasn't glued to the fretboard. This took a lot of work, but was worth it to have all that extra zero cote to play around with. Next order of business was to move to the router table and get a starter cut with a pattern bit. I made sure to move it up in small increments until I could transfer to a flush trim bit. If you don't want an overhanging fretboard, I'd recommend putting the template on the bottom of the neck and trim to it accordingly. Once the initial trimming was complete, I switched bits to the Mega Mini flush trim bit. I'll leave a link in the description. The neck was turning out clean and I was at the home stretch, until I made a big stupid dumb dumb mistake. I fed the headstock the wrong direction and the bit decided to throw the neck across my shop. It left this nasty tear out, but luckily it was intact enough to be able to glue it back into position. After it dried, Sean and I developed a radius jig to get a perfect 9.5 inch radius along the fretboard, which is typical for a lot of bass guitars. There's quite a few jigs out there similar to this, but it didn't cost $200, just some scrap ply and bearings instead. Sean eventually took over the radius work while I enjoyed some popcorn. I've been eliminating some of this belly fat recently, so I needed to completely indulge in a guilt-free snack while Sean finally did some damn work around here. Luna decided to join us while Sean smoothed out the router marks with the radius sanding block. This Ciracote may be disgusting, but Sean had a different outlook on what to do with the sawdust. Shaping the neck was easy with this massive table edge router bit. It has the perfect shape for a guitar neck and subtle passes until the desired thickness seems to be the easiest way to do the initial shaping. We stuck some stop locks on the neck itself so the shaping didn't go too far into the headstock or the heel, but we removed them so you could see this better. Final shaping was done with a series of rasps, planes, sandpaper to get a shape which was subjectively comfortable for Sean's disgustingly long fingers. 
I moved to drilling the headstock peg holes. This allows me to not worry about the blowout on the other side so the thinning can remove it later. Using the bandsaw, I held the headstock flat against the fence and sliced a thin piece off the top. This helps with the string angle and aesthetics and the rest was removed with a handsaw. The transition was cleaned up and smoothed at the spindle sander to make it flow a bit nicer. The neck was finally oiled up before knocking out the fretwork. I was kind of sad with how dark it made this Zeracote, but it still turned out nice. When bending fret wire, I learned it was useful to bend it slightly tighter than the radius of the fretboard. Sean finally decided to stop being lazy and cut the frets to approximate size, keeping them organized to save materials as much as possible. Using the drill press attachment, the frets were pressed in while Sean simultaneously cracked my cast iron table. Once the frets were set, they were flush trimmed with a modified end cutter, then filed down flush to the edge of the neck. Don't be fooled by the next part. Sean spent about six hours filing and polishing each and every fret until it was as smooth and shiny as smooth and shiny a fret could be. If you've ever wondered why 1 8 chisels are made, this is why. Creating a clean mortise for the nut was one of the final steps needed to completing this neck, although they are extremely annoying to sharpen and control due to their small size. The nut was super glued into place and the final hardware was added for completion. String trees and neck ferrules are all that's necessary for bolt-on necks such as this. Overall, this base turned out to be one of a kind. If you enjoyed watching and learning, please like and subscribe so we can continue bringing these videos to you. Thanks for watching and happy building.